Bob Reese founded a ministry called Jesus Wept International. A retired U.S. Marine and FedEx employee, along with his wife, Glenda, have invested their lives in a ministry to Uganda. Now, after a trip to Uganda many years ago, Bob and Glenda were led of the Lord to buy a piece of property that would become known as God's Garden. Bob has joined us here on this show, Mid-South Viewpoint, in the past, many times, matter of fact. So we're going to welcome Bob Rees back to the Bot Radio Network here to provide an update on the work in Uganda. Bob, it's good to see you. You're looking great. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's good to be here, and it's good to have some time to spend with you. Bob, how long has it been now since you took that very first trip to Uganda? You know, I lose track, but it's been in the neighborhood of 20 years. About 20 years. Now, how many trips have you taken to assist the work there since then? <laughs> I uh, lost track of that, too, but I would say <laughs> in the neighborhood of 25 trips. Okay, that's almost a trip a year, basically. That's true, and it used to be that I would go uh, for three months at a time. And that worked out good financially because airfare is the same whether you go for three days or three months. Uh, but my body just had a hard time dealing with three months. What I look for and get most of the time is indoor plumbing, clean linen, um, a fan because air conditioning is really not common uh, and uh, if I've got that I'm pretty happy you're pretty good That's right. <laughs> what's the latest on your health I know you've had some health issues in the past and have dealt with over the years well my health isn't bad it's just not you know I'm 71 years old now and uh, it's a little bit of a struggle. For instance, I used to really enjoy flying and, and traveling from here to Uganda, and now it, it's a real struggle. Yeah. Uh, it's a long trip and not, not nearly as enjoyable as it used to be. I have a lot of trouble sleeping now, and I've been told that that's because my body, my, my internal clock is confused uh, because even just being there for a month or two or three, uh, it's back and forth and back and forth and it really doesn't know what time it is. And yeah. so it is not uncommon for me to wake up at four o'clock in the morning <laughs> for a couple hours and then yeah. go back to bed. Is your wife, Linda, doing well? She is doing well. Uh, in fact, you know, she's had hearing problems her whole life and recently had a cochlea implant, which has helped her some. Uh, it's confused me a little bit because I think her hearing is better than it is, and I'll say something and think she got it, and two days later I'll find out she didn't. <laughs> so, uh, but praise God, uh, yes. uh, things are good. Bob, what does the ministry at God's Garden look like today, and what ministry projects are currently taking place there since it first started? Okay, well, it's amazing how God has been working there. Um, just recently, Uganda has uh, been building a train line, and they put a train station 200 feet from the property line of God's garden. So people from virtually across Uganda can come there to pray and uh, uh, seek the Lord easily. Uh, and when we bought the land and built God's garden, and uh, there was nothing there. We, at the beginning, it took 30 minutes to drive the five miles from where the road 
stop being a road and and stored being a trail uh and then we had no running water had no electricity and so those things have come along and and uh this train i'm really excited about when the train gets put in some of the last conversations we've had uh, on this show we've talked about uh, a pond being built yes uh we've got a pond and uh a pretty good crop of fish in there that uh, people come by uh, on a pretty regular basis and like to pull a fish out every now and again. You mentioned about prayer and a place of being uh, alone with the Lord to seek the Lord. That's really kind of the original intent for God's garden, a retreat place, if you will. That's true, but I, I'll tell you, when we bought the land, I didn't know what God wanted to do with it. Uh, I've told this story before. I had always said that I didn't want to have any land. I didn't because, you know, I'm not a professional pastor, preacher, and I didn't want things to detract from my sharing the word of God and I thought owning a, f a facility uh, buildings and all the things that go with that might do that and one day I woke up and my wife uh, I told her that uh, I felt we needed to go out and buy some land and she thought I was crazy and you know? so but we did that and it's been extremely extremely beneficial and uh uh and not just in within the walls of god's garden but in the community there where yes. classes for sewing uh what are some other things you've been able to do well the the sewing classes uh something that we we've done in the recent past is uh even in africa just like in the united states uh, younger people sometimes aren't as interested in religion, Christianity, as our uh, forefathers were. And so uh, we started uh, a ministry there that was called uh, Combat for Christ where we taught younger people to uh, karate. And that's, once again, in, in Uganda, there's not a, as much TV as there is here in the United States, but uh, it's there and, and you'll have three-year-olds doing karate chops and things. <laughs> So uh, we introduced that, uh, and it's been well received by the younger generation. And uh, uh, but it's all Christ-based. It's not be prepared to go beat somebody up. Uh, the things, the the studying, the the, the whole personal, program. yeah, the whole program is based around Jesus Christ. Bob, let's talk a little about Esther, a godly Sudanese woman that has served as land and ministry supervisor at God's Garden. And there's a story here, but I want to kind of start with how you first met Esther. The, the first time I went to Africa and I went to Sudan with a, a friend of mine, way and uh, not even a friend and a, a somebody I had met and he invited me to go with him and he said you know uh, South Sudan right now is just coming out of a, a civil war uh, everybody's got guns uh, they're on one side or another this is a place that you could get shot, so it's not some place you just want to go because you've never been there. So he said, pray about it, and if you want to go, you can go with me. Well, I did, and I did, and um, the place we stayed, 
uh, Sudan for Christ was the name of the ministry. Esther was working there. And after about two days, she said to me, when you get your own place here in Africa, I want to work for you. And at that point, I told her, well, that's not going to happen because I have no intention to get land or what, all the things that go along with that. And then, oh, I don't know, two years later, three years later uh, is when I woke up and knew I needed to get some land. And not too shortly after that, or not too long after that, I should say, uh, I went to the little village where we bought the land. The man that had roughly three acres had actually gotten real close to selling it, and he was going to be able to sell it for $18,000. And he talked to me, and he said, I said, I, I can't pay $18,000. I, I'd been there for three months, and I was as broke as you could be in the first place. But uh, what I, I told him, I could probably go back and scrounge up $8,000, and he said he'd sell it to me for that, even though he was going to sell it to... Uh, a large school, Muslim school, that wanted to put a uh, university-type situation there. and uh, But he'd rather have a Christian place like God's Garden. So well, he took a tremendous loss, and I went home, raised the, the money, and in within a month send it to him and close the deal that's how it all began well esther as we've mentioned who has run the god's garden as the land and ministry supervisor also adopted three girls and raised them to be her own since their families couldn't take care of them she had a special request bob concerning these girls what was that request well she had diabetes and at the time uh, she had had some toes amputated, and it's hard to be a diabetic in Africa. Uh, people in America think it's hard. Africa's, uh, you know, rice turns into sugar, and that's they eat rice at every meal. So um, she knew she would probably die somewhere along the line, and she said, if I die, I want my children raised as Christians. And then when she was getting sicker and had her foot amputated, she went to spend some time with her parents who were Muslims. And uh, ultimately she stayed there until she died and they took over the girls, which is natural. Yeah. Uh, and I've been in communication with them and told them what Esther wanted. And uh, Which was to raise these girls at God's garden. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, we're in the process of uh, negotiating with them, and I say that intentionally. Um, just like the United States was... 75 100 years ago people who had farms had big families and the families helped them manage the farm so, so these girls would be very important to this family that's right and so uh we will probably we'll do whatever it takes because uh i'm going there for the next month the most important thing on my agenda is to redeem these uh, girls from the family, not because the family is mean to them or anything, but because they will raise them as Muslims. And Esther and the girls have been in church and uh, were good Christians 
uh, I want to be able to continue that. And, Bob, who would be caring for the girls once you were able to negotiate and work out the details for them, the girls, to come to God's Garden? Who would take care of them? Who would be responsible for their care there? Well, I have two pastors that I've worked with for virtually 20 years um, that have their own kids. And the one, the senior pastor, has... uh, taken in many of his own family's children and things to help raise them. And I'm sure that one of these two men can do that, or I know others that would uh, also be willing to. And that's definitely a prayer concern for our listeners as you travel back there in the next few weeks, that God would work out a door, open a door for these girls to return to God's garden and under this care, and there's, we can talk some other issues, too, as we close out. But I also want to mention, before our time goes away, uh, there's a school in Nairobi, the capital of Kenya, where you're planning to have 300 students this semester. Now, how did you go from God's Garden in Uganda <laughs> to Nairobi to start a school? <laughs> well, I would tell you that it definitely it's all God. Uh, I never wanted to have any land. <laughs> I never wanted to open a school, and on both of those things, I argued with God, and and I lost, which I should have known better, but uh, the school, uh, I'll give you the short version, but basically the school, uh, I was walking around the garbage dump in Nairobi. Nairobi is a city of one or two million over a million people and uh, i've been told that the garbage dump is the largest garbage dump in the world uh it's big but i don't know for sure that it's the largest but what i noticed and people have businesses in the garbage dump and try to make a little money they scavenge out of the garbage dump you know they might find a body of a, a wagon someplace and a wheel someplace else and another wheel and eventually put together a wagon and use that uh, for their business or whatever. But um, I was walking around and God impressed upon me, and I don't say that lightly, uh, but he impressed upon me there were an awful lot of of school-age children all around me that weren't in school. And I asked somebody, and they said, well, they're extremely poor, and their families can either feed them, maybe one meal a day, or try to send them to school. And so they don't go to school. And so we opened the school, and just that quick, I said I, uh, I knew I had to start a school. And just that quick, I knew there was no way I could do it because that was one of those times I was really at a loss for funds anyway. And uh, I knew it would be expensive. But... Um, I talked to the pastor that I was there with, and he said he'd been wanting to do it for a long time and uh, thought that $500 a month could get him started. And uh, we did that. And what we do is anybody, absolutely anybody, can come to this school, and uh, we... We feed them two meals a day, and I'll be the first one to tell you, I've eaten those meals, and I think it'd kill me to eat those twice a, that meal twice a day for a week. But uh, they love it because I have to be honest, I, I've never truly been hungry. Yeah. Most Americans have never been there. Right. Uh, but these kids have. And uh, so they they eat it up, and and I shouldn't say it, but it's 
kind of disgusting to me. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you can't see their bones. They put on a little bit of weight. So number one, we feed them. Number two, we tell them about the love of Jesus, which they see because we're feeding them. And number three, we teach them math and English and the Bible, how to read, because we don't have readers, we use the Bible. You think, boy, I hate to ha have had to learn to read, reading the King James Bible, but uh, it's what we got and it works fine. Bob, as you look back through these 20-something years that you've been doing ministry in Uganda, Kenya, Sudan, what has the ministry investment meant to you and Galinda through these many years in Africa? The investment of your time and your lives. Well, yeah, there's been, you know, even though right now I'm going f once a year, okay, uh, and that might be a month, I'm on the phone with Africa two or three times a week. Um, usually somebody has an emergency. Probably the most heart-wrenching thing I've ever encountered is a friend of mine had a young son, oh, I don't know, six months old, that got malaria, and there's always this balance in Africa. Well, we can take them to the doctor, but we don't really have the money or whatever. We can take them to the doctor, and they can take care of them, or maybe they'll be okay. We get a little medicine, and we take care of them here at home. We save that money, and they're always trying to balance that out. That's like people do here in the United States. Uh, you don't want to go to the doctor or the emergency room if you don't have to, if it's going to cost you even a, what, uh, the little bit you pay a lot of times. Uh, the deductible. The deductible. You know, if you got to pay $25 that you really don't have, you don't want to do that. Well, they were balancing that out and they waited too long. They took the baby, the hospital did everything they could, the baby died. And if they'd come to me, if they'd come to me a day, two days earlier and gotten $10 from me, we could have made a difference. $10, Bob? $10. $10 to start with because the the... If I walk into a pharmacy in Uganda and I say, you know, I've had malaria before, I think I've got it again, they give you a little packet of pills, they say, take this for three days and it'll go away. Now, I came back from Uganda one time with malaria. I remember that. <laughs> Took two days, uh, 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 two weeks or whatever, I forget, ended up in the hospital they didn't know what it was i spent over a week 10 days in the hospital the insurance paid a hundred thousand dollars to cure me so uh, uh in america in the united states they're not used to malaria yeah any regrets for spending time in africa like you have no no um uh yes i regret i couldn't have done it haven't done more yeah. uh there is such a great need there they're great people um i think the the greatest thing that the lord's ever used me for has been the ministry in Africa and uh, I regret maybe the first 40 years of my life where I was a Christian an average Christian which to me today 
I'll probably offend some people. The average Christian goes to church, maybe gives their tithes, uh, is a good person, basically, and doesn't make any difference at all. Hopefully, they raise their kids in some way that they make a difference. But the first 40 years of my life as a Christian, I think, was were wasted. Wow. What a indictment for many of us, Bob. But God bless you for being so transparent and sharing your heart. And I appreciate this time. I know our listeners are have an opportunity to pray for you as you prepare to go back to Uganda. We mentioned a couple of projects. Uh, students at this uh, school in Nairobi, uh, some taxes that have to be paid. We can't go into the details. But uh, the government could potentially put the headmaster in jail if this fee isn't paid. Yeah. And we don't want to see that happen. And it's a fee of around $1,000. And then there's also negotiating fees uh, for these three girls to be able to pay off a, a ransom, if you will, uh, to redeem them, to take them back to God's garden at the request of Esther. We know there's costs that are involved there. How can our friends stay involved in this ministry, Jesus Wept International? How can they pray for you? I know you have letters that go out. How can we keep in touch with you so we can get this information? Well, some people don't like Facebook, but Facebook book works very good for me. It's a way of putting the information out. And if you go to Facebook and you look up Robert, middle initial M, Reese, R-I-E-S, you can find us. If you look up Jesus Wept International, you can find us. Uh, and I think God's Garden, you can find us. And uh, that also will have our uh, mailing address. Uh, that's, you know, send, send me a check. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be put to uh, use. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and this is a nonprofit ministry. You're yes, set up as a is. nonprofit. Yeah. Um, and, and we put a lot of money into it uh, over the 20 years, but I'll tell you what, that's not a regret at all. Um, it's been well spent, and we don't have any kind of near the time it would take to uh, tell you about all of it. God just took your heart and just molded it into what he wanted to do, you know? You just made yourself available. And I think that's what God is asking each of us to do is make ourselves available for the kingdom of God uh, as followers of Christ to go beyond that Sunday morning pew and uh, even a tithe, but to offer our lives for his service for the great things that he has done and has planned in reaching the world, reconciling the world, as the scripture says, uh, to himself through us. And so God bless you. Thanks so much for stopping by here. All of our time has slipped on this program. We'll have to say goodbye, but I'm looking forward to updates, okay? We'll have to mm -hmm. stay in touch and keep our listeners updated. I'll be back in March. All so, right. Uh, well, friends, that's all the time we have on this edition of Mid-South Viewpoint. Thanks for stopping by. I'm Byron Tyler, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.